Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and in this video, we're going to talk about a verse of scripture that has frightened Christians for millennia. Gracious Heavenly Father, I come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful, so very thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to study your word together, to feast upon it, to meditate on it, to think about it. I just ask that you would take and filter out all of that which is not of you, all of that which is of ignorance and foolishness, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth for we long to grow in grace and knowledge of you in christ's name i pray amen i've always found it amazing how that this verse which is was intended to be for our comfort uh, tends to cause discomfort in the lives of many christians Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. And uh, so many often, so often, uh, so many times, uh, Christians will focus on the first part of that verse and rather than uh, the whole verse, or just look at, uh, concentrate on the first half of the verse without really thinking, putting a lot of thought into the second part of the verse. In fact, the second part of the verse is not so readily agreed upon that, that well that's really not what that means uh, god is working in us both the will and do of his good pleasure how can that possibly be because you know i've looked at my life and it just it, and i see in the lives of others how that that just can't possibly be the case so i want to i want to just kind of hover over this for a moment uh now, there's a whole lot that could be said in review, but the, in the immediate context, we just got through in our last video, I was, I was focusing on the, the death of Christ. And uh, I think that today, Christians, for the, for the most part, or Christianity in the main, uh, doesn't really, and I don't know how to put this, I, I don't think it really, it's kind of like, it's kind of like where you know you would try to get all of you can all that you can get out of something you know you you're, you're trying to squeeze all of the you know the juice out of the orange and i don't think that we've done that when it comes to the death the burial and the resurrection of christ for the most part today christianity looks at the death and the burial and the resurrection of christ is something that that occurred in in real time, real hi in history, 
And uh, it was a crucial turning point in God's program of, of uh, redemption. In fact, he, the whole nation of Israel was, was established just so that God would have some place to plant a cross. But as far as the, the full meaning of, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and all that that death implied, I think Christianity in the main falls short of understanding just what what occurred there uh, on that cross. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both the will and to do of his, of his good pleasure. So what appears to be discomforting uh, I hope that you will find, by the, by the time we get to the end of this video, I hope you'll find this uh, extremely comforting. Now, the word there in the text uh, for fear is phobo, phobos. Uh, it's used uh, for, you know, uh, just as you would think that the word is used for. Uh, but it means to withdraw or separate from, that is, flee or remove your oneself thereby avoiding something because of dread it's uh the word uh, fear has the connotation of, of withdrawing or fleeing from to avoid or to be separate from something that is causing you fright okay and it's often used negatively of withdrawing from the lord uh, and his will uh, trembling is the word traumas. It's used to describe the anxiety of one who, who distrusts his ability. Now, you Greek students out there can, can sort through that on your own, but that's, that's basically the word meanings. Now, what I want you to do, folks, dearly beloved, I want you to, first of all, note what the verse does not say. You know, for it is God which uh, would like to work in you both to will and do of his good pleasure, if only you'd let him. Doesn't say that. God's will and God's doing, okay, that's what we see in the verse, his work, is set in contrast with our will and our doing. I think we need to also see here that our work is not synonymous with his work in our lives. The two are not one and the same. There's obviously a response on our part. So we can't say that our working is the same as his working is what I'm, was what I'm trying to say. Uh, our work is in response to his work in our lives. There's another thing, it's, it's an all-important thing. I mean, this, this is, you have to, we've got to get this nailed down right from the start. It's plural. We're, we're looking at the, just look at the, the letter itself. It's written to a church. It's written to the Philippians. It's no wonder it's in the plural, okay? And that one aspect of Greek grammar, as simple as it is, you know, the, the you know, distinguishing between the singular and the plural, uh, here has has profound implications. I, I don't even hardly know where to begin talking about it. It's all inclusive. It is you all plural, all inclusive. That is every child of God. I want you to consider the profound implications of that. You know, especially given the fact uh, the verse, uh, uh, the will, the work of God didn't begin when we did something okay well uh, it, it work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it's God which be, began a, a work in you both the will and do of his good pleasure the minute that you accepted Christ or the minute that you were born again the moment that you were born again that began the process and from that point forward God was working in you both the will and do of his good it doesn't say that Uh, not even when we were born again by the will of God, but from the foundation of the world. Folks, that has profound implications. I, 
how can we not see the importance of knowing His will, okay, and His doing, that is His work, in our lives, when we have a verse that says, it is God which worketh in you both the will and do of his good pleasure. It seems to me like that we would go out of our way to find out what God's will was and, and what his work was in our lives. Now, these are just some of the, the, the beginning, you know, the questions that we, we could begin ask, asking of the text right from the start. I do know that our knowing His will and doing uh, His will and work in our lives, it's only realized through His Word. We can only come to understand what His will is by studying this book. We can only come to understand uh, what His work was in our lives, what He accomplished, what, he's, what He did, what He's doing, what He will do by studying His Word. So. The idea of, of the just the, the fact of the Word of God alone, uh, the importance, the vital importance of, of us knowing it, it's we be it, every it all begins with knowing, okay? Trusting follows knowing, but we've got to know. We have to know. We need to know His His will. We need to know His work in our lives, and that's only realized through God's Word. And we're commanded to study to show ourselves, ourselves approved unto God, a workman, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And which, in, in my opinion, would be equivalent to, to the word of life in the text. So we're going to be looking at this one, kind of focusing heavily on this one particular verse. And uh, the reason why I want to do that is because the, the verse itself has caused much discomfort in the lives of Christians down through the ages. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And now all of a sudden we, 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 we realize that we are, uh, we are in a situation where the, whereby we are relating to a God which is not the God, if we're not careful, we're responding to a God of, of our imagination, one that's not a, not a God, the God, the God of Scripture, but some God of our own imagination uh, in which uh, uh, fear and trembling, uh, it's, uh, it's, I know fo you, you folks, surely you must understand kind of where I'm driving, what I'm driving at with this to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling on the surface appears to be a statement which if we're not careful would drive us off away from christ into uh, into a, a realm uh, of of existence uh, in which we we really are not acknowledging the the, the real truth that, concerning who God is and what he's done in our lives. Fear and trembling. I mean, that, that sounds scary. And uh, it's it shouldn't be. Uh, I welcome, just speaking personally for myself, I welcome the invitation. And this is a command, but I, I welcome that invitation, that command to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Why? Because, and the verse answers it's th that question. Because, or for, it is God which worketh in you both the will and do of his good pleasure. Now, if we stop and really meditate on those words for just a few moments, I think that what we will discover is something very profound and something very dynamic god is going to work in my life both the will and do of his good pleasure whether i like it or not okay god has always okay worked in my life both the will and do of his good pleasure even when i didn't know that he was was doing so uh, it does not say it, you know, God, he'd really love to work in, in, in your life, you know, according to his, 
uh, both the will and do of his good pleasure. That's really God's desire. He would just love to do that. If only you would just let him, okay? You know, agree. And so we're going to go on with this, and I'm going to, I'm going to try to look, sort of use this that that one verse as a somewhat of a of a of a foundation for everything else that's going to follow. It's interesting how that we see the the same words. We see the words will and pleasure in Ephesians one nine, having made made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. Ephesians 1.9. Purposed. Okay? As in designed beforehand, if you really want to know what the word means, in the Greek the word purposed means designed beforehand. That is determined. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. I wonder how many Christians today really understand what God gives God pleasure. I think many of them might think that because of the difficult trials that, and circumstances and hardships that they're going through, that they would think that if they didn't know any better, they would think that it, God took, had pleasure in, in tormenting them. You know, the flesh is a terrible thing. The, the unrenewed mind is a terrible thing. To have the wrong thoughts about God is, is, is something that we really don't want to have, folks. The one... Uh, here's the interesting thing about this. It, it, it involves belief and trust. This is the work, folks, of God, that ye should believe in him whom he has sent. This is what the word says. It involves rest, okay? In Hebrews, let us fear lest a promise being left, uh, left us of entering into his rest, and he should come short of it. So it involves rest. The, the, the work out your, your salvation with fear and trembling for his God at work in you both the will and do of his good pleasure is not some exhortation to, to, to light your pants on fire and get you going. You know, you, you need to get busy and you need to get, you need to, you need to straighten things, kind of turn things upright in your life. It's, that's not what the verse is saying at all. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who is going to punish you if you don't. Uh, work out your, your salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, for it is God who would like to work in you, you know, both the will and do of his good pleasure. But he just he just has a, such a hard time doing that because you just seem to in, get in the way all the time of that. You know, it, it, we, we will, it's, it's, it's so tempting to read our emotions into these verses. It's so tempting to read our our ignorance into these verses. This is the work of God that you believe in Him whom He has sent. That that is the work of God, you know. Our, our for it is God at work in you both the will and, the, and this is the work of God that you you should believe in Him whom He has sent. This word salvation, the one thing that you need to know too is this is not an evangelistic verse. This is not, he's not speaking to non believers. He's not speaking to the non elect. It's not a call to salvation. It's, it's, it's written to the Philippians. It's written to a body of believers, the church. The, it's plural. It's written to you and me, all of us, all inclusive. Okay. It's talking about a, a, a work out our salvation. That's not our redemption, that's our salvation. And we've talked a lot about that. Uh, we've looked at that a lot in the past. Salvation is a thing past to the Christian. It's a thing present. Okay? And it's a thing future. Now, now Christians tend to focus a lot on the, on the past aspect of that. 
but not so much on the present. And, and they, they tend to focus a lot on the, on the future aspect of that, that there will be a, a deliverance. Our, our bodies will be delivered uh, from this world of this, just this body of corruption. Our, our bodies will be delivered. Uh, we were delivered initially. We are delivered in, in the ongoing sense. There's a salvation in the ongoing sense. It's that salvation in the ongoing sense that is, uh, I believe, the, 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 the primary thought of, of the Holy Spirit in this passage it has to do with the present aspect of salvation. But it is a thing past. It's a thing present. It's a thing future. But all, all, these, all three of these are elements of the one deliverance. The one deliverance, okay? The one mighty and perfect act which includes them all. And they all three depend equally on his work. All three depend equally on his power. The passage clearly reveals that our response to God is to be centered upon the fact that it is God which works in us both the will and to do of his not not that he'd like to, but that but that it's uh, this this is what's happening. It is God which works in us both the will and do of his good pleasure. And it pleased God. Okay? It pleases God. His good pleasure. Uh, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb, said Paul, and called me by his grace. It pleased God. And then we come to verse 14. Do all things without murmurings. I looked at the first occurrence of that word murmuring. Uh, it's, it's found in the context of, of uh, where that they were grumbling over who Jesus was. And of course, uh, you know, that's interesting because would Christians today have their own kind of idea of who Jesus was. And disputings, that's the word is, means back and forth reasoning, okay, that you may be blameless and harmless. Well, that's a high calling, blameless and harmless. Uh, if you turn over to turn back to Luke chapter 1 Luke chapter 1 verse 5 that you may be blameless and harmless is what our text is saying go back to Luke chapter 1 and we see that in the days of Herod a certain priest named Zacharias you know uh, and his, his wife Elizabeth you know, they were, they were, the text says, were both righteous before God. They were walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. That's what the text says. And yet we also have the testimony of God, the Holy Spirit, who says that Israel did none of what God asked them to do. We have the whole entire testimony of the Holy Spirit through Paul saying that the law never made anyone righteous. Zacharias and Elizabeth were not made righteous by the things that they did. They didn't become blameless or harmless. They didn't, be, they didn't stand before God righteous uh, because they, they walked in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord, uh, blameless, flawless. They never, there was never a misstep. That the fact that they were not righteous by a legal righteousness, that which comes through the law, is clear. Because Paul says, for there is none righteous, no, not one, but, but, but righteous in that God accepted them. God accepted them. You're, you're righteous because of the death of Christ. It's only because of Christ dying in your place, which we just left... Just uh, you know, just go back a few verses in our study. Because of that all-sufficient death, because of that death of Christ, that substitutionary death of Christ in your place, 
you stand before God as righteous as Christ. You stand before him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. You've seen this in our past studies. It's not through some legal righteousness, okay, through the law, that we become righteous before God. There is none righteous, no, not one. All righteousness is of the Lord. We have no righteousness in and of ourselves. If, if you want to bring up the righteousness of the saints that's mentioned in, in the book of Revelation, I'm going to tell you that that's, that's, they're, they're, they're right. there is no righteousness apart from uh, God's grace. Right, there's no righteousness that comes through the law. We stand before God, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight because of the price that Christ paid. So we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God at work in us, both the will and do of His good pleasure. And, and if you spend five minutes, folks, thinking about what that verse is saying, I'm, I'm not telling you what you ought to do. I'm, I'm saying it, it ought to boggle your mind. It ought, it ought to really stretch your, your thinking, okay, on this matter. The fact that God is working in me, both the will and do of His good pleasure, ought to cause me to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. Not fear in the sense of that, I, that I fear, you know, I tr you know, uh, well, I don't know, fear, just name it, fear, you know, a horse uh, throwing me and in, you know into a, a, a cactus patch, you know. I, I, I just, I have to draw your attention back to the fact that there's none righteous, no, not one. God accepted Zacharias. He accepted Elizabeth, not based upon their own performance, but he made them righteous. He declared them righteous, just as he did Lot. Lot's, you know, soul was tormented day and night by all the, the, uh, the unrighteousness that he saw. That we are wholly unblameable and unreprovable in, in God's sight, sight. The sons of God without rebuke. The original text says, blameless, innocent children of God. I know your, your, your Bible is likely to say the sons of God without rebuke. The original text says blameless, innocent children. I believe the word there is technon in the Greek. It's the children of God without rebuke. Okay, unblemished, without spot. Uh, and Paul writing to the Philippians, this is the same as is true of us. It was the, what he's telling the Philippians, the same is true of us. Without spot, unblemished, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. The word crooked there meaning warped, curved. It's an interesting word. And perverse nation, nation as in generation or age, a corrupt generation, a corrupt age, a perverse age. In the midst of a crooked and perverse age or generation, okay, they stand blameless and innocent, these children of God. Uh, that, that, that word perverse uh, that's that's an the, in the in the original text that the word means it turned thoroughly into a new shape, which is distorted, twisted, perverted. If you took something that is of some ordinary shape and you twisted it and you perverted it and you distorted it into some other shape other than the original shape that it that it had, that's basically what the word means. It's, it's opposite from the shape or the form which it should be. That's what, that's what it means. Among whom, among whom, and, and in the original text, it's epsilon nu, it's in whom ye shine, ye shine, you become clear as lights in the world. Lights in the world. Lights, uh, the word denotes uh, a brilliant uh Illuminator. Verse 16, holding forth the word of life. The Greek word, the, or the Greek text actually reverses that. 
It's not holding forth the word of life. It's the word of life holding forth, it says in the Greek. This is what Paul's telling the Philippians they do. They hold forth the word of life. That holding forth that is a word that means pay close attention. So that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I haven't run in vain, neither labored in vain. Paul's, the Apostle Paul's labor regarding them, or just not just the Philippians, but his labor in general, was grounded in the preaching of the word of life, the very thing that they're being told to pay close attention to. Now, why does it the text say, well, just, you know, the word? Why doesn't it just say the word? Why, why does it say the word of life? Why include the word life? Uh, seem like just the word, you know, word would be sufficient. All life. That, that word zoe in the Greek. All life throughout the universe is derived. That is, it always and it only comes from God. And it is sustained by God's life. So everything, everything, and I mean, I'm talking about everything, okay? Everything, all life throughout the universe, the known created universe, is, the text is making it clear that it, it, it always and only comes from God and it is sustained by God's life, the fact that God lives. <clears throat> that zoe, the word zoe for life, it denotes a quality of life. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a quality in the sense of, it's not life in the sense of, of duration, or, uh, but quality. And then this took me all the way back in my study to John 1, 4, in him was life and the life was the light of men. It's amazing. Just That's just what we're reading here in our present study. John 1, 4. In him was life and the life was the light of men is what, is what it says. And I find that interesting. He was the living and powerful word, which was the source of life to every living creature, the author of life. We know he's the author and finisher of our faith. The author of life to all that live. And the new creation is often compared with the first creation. Uh, I've, I've spoke some on this. This is, this, this is a quite interesting parallel. Uh, the logos, okay, the, uh, the source of life, uh, the word, the living word, uh, in, a, in a similar but, but a higher sense, he is the source of life. He gives life unto the world. Uh, John 6, 33, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, John uh, eleven twenty five. this is the true God and eternal life. Uh, John 5, 20, the, you know, the meaning is, is that he is the source or the fountain of both natural and spiritual life. Now, he's the source, okay? There's only one source. He's the true source. He's the only source, Okay. And this is what we are. We are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God at work in us both the will and do of his good pleasure. Uh, folks, it's not difficult to see where the, the, that this, this text, what this text is bringing us around to. You know, to, it's, it's, it's wanting us to focus our attention on. Okay? Uh, 
Colossians 3, 4, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. We've seen here in our present study, you know, for us to, for, to me to live is Christ. The verse does not say when human merit, which is our life. Okay, that's not what I said. Uh, human performance that's that's our life and, and you you would think that I mean when you know you if you talk to to many many Christians today you would think that that's exactly what they that's how they view it that's that's their life well you know what is your life well it's 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 trying to to please God to the best of my ability that's that's pretty much how that they would define that and I'm gonna suggest there's an enormous gulf an enormous difference between that and for me to live is Christ. Uh, there's no indication in this text or in any other text that would suggest that our life, this life, the Christ life, is realized or experienced through some achievement of, of our own. Some victory that we ourselves gained. Some level of dedication which we have attained or, you know, or maintained. Our reward will be based upon how we built on Christ. I've, I've mentioned this before, I believe. Uh, it's, it's how we built on that one foundation, Christ. And I suggest that this was the Holy Spirit's concern. This was Paul's concern for the believers at Philippi. The question here is how could his name become more exalted? Okay. We, we saw that he's been, we saw it from the text uh, in our last study. We, uh, God has exalted his name above every other name. How can his name become more exalted? I mean, uh, I mean, hold on a minute. I thought he's God. This is God incarnate in human flesh. God of very God. The one who spoke the worlds into existence. He was, the, he, was, he was the son of man before he became incarnate in human flesh. How could his name become more exalted? He's God. He's God of very God. I suggest to you that the grand theme of glory will be the person and the work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In whom all the fullness of the triune God came to permanently and bodily rest, bodily dwell. Uh, I believe that explains why his name, God the Father, exalted his name above every other name. That I'm gonna, at least that's my, that's how I'm looking at the text. I believe the text is telling us that the reason the Father exalted His name above all other, any other name is because of what Christ did in, or that which resulted in the very fullness of the triune God coming to permanently and bodily dwell in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When we get to heaven, I believe we'll see a God-man sitting on the throne. Uh, so I, 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 I think that perfectly explains how that the name of Christ, God of very God, who spoke the worlds into existence, could be exalted above every, every name. Another interesting verse that in Hebrews the, chapter 2, verse 18, that for since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he's able to come to the aid of those who were tempted. And we look at that word tempted and we fail to realize that the word means tested. The testing being related to the question of whether we will trust God or not. Dearly beloved, the, the testing, the temptation of Christ. Okay, the real, if you want to talk about that, we're looking at God can't be tempted by sin. Okay, I, it, I don't know how, how many of you out there have, have put much thought in, in, into the fact 
that God Almighty incarnate in human flesh, he, ha he didn't have a sin nature. He could not have sinned. It's not, well, he, he somehow managed to, to live his entire life up to the point of the cross without sinning, but he could have. And that is the wrong, that is the wrong way of thinking. He could he could not have sinned because he was God. He didn't have a sinful nature. That's that's why he was born of a virgin. He was without sin. He who knew no sin became sin on on our behalf in order that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That's how you became righteous. But. He could not be tempted in the sense of, of sinning, okay? That, that was not the testing that Christ, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, endured. It was a testing, okay, that was related to the question of whether he would trust the Father. And that is exactly what occurs in your life. That's exactly what occurs in my life. In fact, that's, that's, what, that's how it was with Eve. In the beginning, Eve was tested, tempted. The, the whole purpose of that was to, not, to, to, to call into question, Eve calling into question what was true. Well, they, they, I know what God said, but uh, he didn't, you know, Satan, you know, telling Eve that, that, well, God didn't tell you everything. Uh, Eve's entire test was in trusting what God said. Same with our, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Same, so it is with us. Now, I've just made a partial list here. I want to I I quickly just uh, run through some of these. These are biblical uh, terms, New Testament terms. I think most of them, for, for the most part, most of these are, 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 are ignored unrealized uh they're not discussed there there's not much of a focus on these these aspects of christian uh, doctrine uh there's god's sovereignty there's the divine election there's god's justice there's redemption the matter of redemption forgiveness justification sanctification uh identification uh, we can talk about reconciliation. We can talk about God's love, is God's comfort. We can talk about eternal security. We can talk about assurance. We can talk about the faith that's articulated. You know, there's faith and then there's the faith. We can talk about belief and suffering. And, and I've talked about how we can't separate the two from one another. We talk about the mind of Christ. Uh, uh, why do I bring all that up? Well, uh, how many Christians are there today, do you think, who actually believe this book, that God is sovereign? He's supremely sovereign. That God is working in you both the will and do of his good pleasure. His good pleasure. Not your good pleasure, but His good pleasure. You were bought with a price. It's, it says, We were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. That is the, the that's, a, that's a singular, uh, the body, the body of Christ. Uh, just the fact of that we were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. You know, what about God's justice? You know, we, we talk about justice. It, it, was it just for God to lay all of my sin on Christ? That if, if we're going to talk about propitiation and God being satisfied, the Father becoming satisfied with the payment that Christ, His Son, made for sin. Uh, that's propitiation okay where i guess the point i'm trying to make is 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 in in all of this these items of 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 topics of discussion whether we're talking about redemption 
uh, that we're born again by the will of God, not the will of the flesh. Whether we're talking about forgiveness, as it says in Colossians, that we've been forgiven of all our trespasses. Not just all, just those up until the time we were born again. That we're, we were justified, we were made righteous, justified by faith. That we we're, uh, through one offering, you know, sanctified, uh, set apart. That that when he died, he, we died. When he was buried, we were buried. When he was raised, we were raised to walk in newness of life. So there's that identification with Christ. Uh, where that it is not I, but Christ. It's the exchanged life. It's not flesh. It's spirit. It's not law. It's grace. Uh, we've been reconciled to God, that God was in Christ reconciling us to himself. Uh, it wasn't God that needed reconciled to us. It was us that needed reconciled to God. God's love, his undying love, unending love. Never a moment in your life in which in which he he's, he steps outside uh, that realm of love. Uh, that were it, it amazes me even to this day that there are actually are there actually Christians out there who believe that we're not that salvation is is depends well it's it's we're eternally secure only only in as much as we. We keep ourselves, you know, maintain our salvation, or we we keep ourselves saved. But we can eternal. There, we're really not eternally secure. There is no such thing as once saved, always saved. That's that's. Uh, and you see a lot of, of Christians fighting on YouTube over that subject. In fact, even in the real world, it's 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 not just just a as commonly accepted a belief as you would think. Uh, to me, I can't hardly believe that there are Christians nowadays who don't believe that, that, that they're eternally secure in Christ. But there are. You know, eternal life is, is eternal life. We have eternal life. You can't have eternal life and then not have eternal life. And this whole idea of, of having the mind of Christ, the same mind of Christ. I wish that, well, there's, there is great, uh, great benefit, I, th I believe, in interpreting these passages that we're looking at with the aforementioned aspects that, that I talked about in mind you know we're looking at folks the comfort of God's grace the comfort of his work the, the in un, our understanding his will not not having some misconceived notion of what his will is in our lives uh, an understanding of our inability our weakness uh, his strength. There is the abject need to know. We need to know. The need to trust Him. Trust in Him, not ourselves. So it's, it begins with knowing and then trusting. And that's, that's trusting Him at all times and in all things. And there's a need to rest, whereby He produces in and through us what we could never produce in our own strength. I'm talking about knowing just who Christ Jesus is, what He's done, what He's doing and will do. You know, the only source of true life, the only, the only means of deliverance in a world that is opposite from the shape or the form of which it should be. In whom we shine, or we become clear as lights in the world. 
lest we receive the grace of God in vain. No wonder it don't worry no wonder no wonder it says do all things without murmuring or disputing. Okay, no wonder it says that. The majestic sovereign God of all creation has us all right where he wants us to be. But we don't want to believe that. Therefore, we see murmuring and complaining. As a result, there's murmuring and disputing. I, folks, I cannot imagine telling some Christian that he shouldn't be where God, where I know God has placed him. Okay, when when as, when God has determined that he or she be where they are. Okay, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna go up to him and I'm gonna tell him that I don't think that they ought to be there. I'm trying to get the point across to you here, folks. It, it, I'm trying to get you to look at just how profound this verse is. The, the implications of this verse are profound, okay? It means that no matter what your situation, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, wherever you are is where God has placed you. It is God who is working in you both the will and do of His good pleasure. His good pleasure. It pleases Him. Oh, but, oh, that can't possibly be true. We see a brother over here and he's involved in sin. and he's, Or he's involved in this, that, or the other thing. And we say, you know, you shouldn't be there. You, should be, you shouldn't be there. You should be over here. And, 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 of course, why do we say over here? Well, over here is where we are. So, you know, this is where we are, so that's where they ought to be. And we, are you getting this, folks? It's the whole mindset is one of, of legality, okay? Law, human performance, human merit. The person's there because that's where, and, and boy, and they deserve to be there, too. You know, they made their bed, and they ought to just lie in it. I'm going to suggest to you that, you know, and I'm going to, and, and this is, I don't usually open up much about my past, but I, I remember back a long time ago when I was a lot younger in the Lord, falling into, a, falling into a trap, you know, as far as sin was concerned. And uh, at the time, I just, it was, my whole mindset, my whole attitude was I should not be here doing this because I'm a Christian and so I and so I shouldn't be doing this I should be doing this other thing and I should be doing something else other than what I'm doing and, and this is wrong and that I and I and as far as I was I was concerned I put myself in that situation and it was of course there was a conflict that was occurring in between the flesh and the spirit I was torn being pulled two directions you know, I had my old man and I had my new man and my new man hated this old man situation that I was in. And it was somehow I, I was led to believe that I had stepped outside God's will and I had gone apart from God's will. Now, wait a minute. OK, just stop. Just stop and think about this. I actually had the power to usurp God's authority, God's sovereignty, God's will, God's purpose, God's design, God's pleasure in my life. Do I really have, do you and I, do you honestly folks think, folks, do you honestly think that we actually have that kind of power, that we have that kind of strength, that the, the, the will of the creature can override the will of the creator? Are you kidding me? Okay. If if you if you were to, to walk up to me and and dare suggest that somehow we we can find ourselves in situations in which the will of the creature overrides the will of the creator, you, <clears throat> I may just do an about face, complete about face, and just walk away. I, I just I I don't even know how to re address. I would not know how to address that directly, I don't think, especially not if I was caught off guard. or I... Folks, think, okay? No wonder it, the text says, do all things without murmuring or disputing, okay? That, there's no place for murmuring. There's no place for disputing when the majestic all-powerful, all-knowing, 
sovereign God of all creation, the one who hung the stars in the sky, the one who says he's working in you both the will and do of his good pleasure. When he has you right where he wants you to be. Oh, but no, that just can't be true. I, it can't possibly be true that God would have me be where I am. I'm going to suggest that's exactly what's going on. There is never a moment I will I will tell I will I'm I don't have any problem, folks, saying to you, to you dearly beloved people, precious folks for whom Christ died. I have no problem telling you directly, unapologetically telling you that God is working in you both the will and do of his good pleasure. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what your situation is. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. We cannot detract from the strength, the power, the honest truth of the verse. We are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling because God, precisely because God is working in us both to will and to do of His good pleasure. He has a purpose in what He takes us through. Folks, He's, he's, he's lit your path. He's marked out your path. We're talking about God here, okay? I mean, can we not lose sight of the fact that we're talking about the the God of all creation? The the I, I think somehow we've made God just like Israel. God said of Israel, just we made him out to be too much like ourselves. I'm going to pick up here with. Uh, right here next time in our next video i want to talk some more about this because i it's been my prayer that that through this that i i could somehow and i i, I don't feel like i've done an adequate job of dealing with this text I, I just i don't i don't even know how we we any person could i just see it as that dynamic i mean you know just the the fact that, that what we of what we saw the, in the previous verses of of the death of of, of Christ the, even the death of the cross I, I just don't think that I could ever do justice to that I, I certainly find it difficult to do justice to this one particular verse to work out our salvation with fear and trembling for it is God at work work in us both the will and do of his good pleasure that is a constant, folks. It's not, well, it's, he, he's, he started out working in you both the will and do of his good pleasure, but then somehow you muck, mucked that up. You changed that, and you forced God into some, uh, you forced God uh, into a, a situation where that he could no longer do that. It is a constant, folks. You've got to see it as a constant. And not just that that's what's occurring today. The, the, the fact of the matter is, is that that's, it's always been the case. He's always worked in your life, both the will and do of his good pleasure, always. And it didn't begin just when you were born again. Okay? It's, it's, it was from the foundation of the world. Look, I got to go. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.